everybody. Uh, we'll continue with a talk from uh, Kobe's team. Uh, Kobe is all about discovering your government's business lead. Kobe will allow you to anonymously view the address book of your contacts to find uh, the best conduct for each situation. You will be able to better understand your network of contacts. Okay, I'll cover that kind of stuff. So, okay. Uh, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. I think you can uh, explain it better than me. So, welcome, Alexandros, Paladis, Manolis, <coughs> and Michael. Guys, these are the kinds of humanitarian issues we face at COVE every single day. Hi, I'm Alex Prodigerelis. I'm a co-founder, CTO, head of HR, project manager, head of legal uh, at COVE. And um, I'll be joined today by three of our excellent engineering team. And we'll talk to you about COVE's evolution or COVE's architecture's evolution <coughs> through the cloud, where we started off, where we're heading, some of the things we've learned along the way. Um, hope you find the joy enjoyable. And I think it's a kind of subject that probably separates the, the men and the women from the mice, as they say. So thank you each personally for attending this uh, relatively, relatively detailed, relatively technical session. Um, so first of all, a bit about Covert. Um, the company, the people, a bit about what we do before we dive into the actual kind of technology, right? So both myself and my co-founder Yanis, who's here in the audience as well, we started off uh, a decade ago in big corporations uh, in London, across Europe, consultancies, banks, th those kinds of corporations. And across the board, kind of time and time again, we saw the same issue, or the same opportunity, right? You'd have people trying to do, to strike a deal. You might uh, have a partner trying to sell to a bank or, or a, a senior manager at a, one of the big consultancies trying, trying to do a deal. And, and they might struggle, right? Doing a deal, doing a sale is, is difficult, it's hard work, it's a lot of investment. And you know what? Next to them, there might be sitting this analyst, or maybe in a different city there might be another partner who happens to know exactly the right person to make that deal happen. They might know the head of procurement at the bank, right? And whoever of you have done any sales in your life will know that having that kind of link makes a sale happen, makes a deal happen. Usually, the connection would never be made, and the sale or the deal could go either way. And that's where Covert comes in. Covert is a software as a service tool for business professionals to enable them to find the warmest leads from the people they trust. That's what it does. Now, the way it does it, take you through the process a little bit so that you, you can understand what we do. First of all, it synchronizes with your address book. That might be your iPhone, it might be Gmail or Google Contacts, it might be the, the company's, the corporate exchange server. And we feel that's very important, okay? We feel that business professionals don't keep their contacts in, in Facebook or even LinkedIn, they're, they're on Twitter. No, they keep them on their phone, they keep them close, it's an asset, they've been maintaining it for years, it's valuable. Okay, it's that kind of stuff. So we integrate with the address book, none of the other stuff. Um, so we integrate with the address book, we, we draw in the contacts. First thing we do is we add a lot of metadata. We add the metadata, locations, companies, information to enrich the address book. Then we visualize it, and we'll see a bit of, uh, more about that uh, later, to give people perspective. And then the most important thing we do is we enable people to share their contacts privately. Okay, now that's quite a new concept, we feel. Uh, so I'll illustrate by an example. Let's say that I'm heading to San Francisco next week, and you know what, I'd really like to have some meetings with investors kind of waiting for me when I land there. You know, who wouldn't, right? So I log into Covert, I type in Investor, California, San Francisco, and Covert might tell me, you know what, Alexis, who I met yesterday here at Insights, happens to know two or three people who match that profile. They're investors, they're seniors, one seems to be have a job title of you know, an angel, the other one works at a VC. So those are really interesting contacts. Now what Covet won't do 
is share the name of these people and the contact details. Okay? We feel that that information is valuable, it's private, and it's the asset of the people, of the person who owns the address book. Okay? So we won't share that detail. We respect the privacy and the ownership of that data. What we will do is it will enable me to pick up the phone. You know what? I, I, won't, I won't message the guy, I won't poke the guy. No, this is business. I'll pick up the phone, we'll have a proper discussion, and if things line up, if it makes business sense, he'll make a proper warm introduction. And you know what? Next week I might go to San Francisco and I'll have a warm investor waiting for me. Or a warm uh, procurement manager waiting for me to pitch. So that's what COVID does, in a nutshell. Okay? Software as a service, business tool to enable people to privately share contacts to make deals happen. So that's COVID in a nutshell. And what I'll do now is I'll show you a few screenshots just to bring it to life. And then we'll dive into technology. And the guys here will, will dive a lot deeper. So I hope you're ready for that. Um, so, as we said, it enables you to find people. That's the, the heart of Covet. So it enables you to search the world. Um, pretty detailed search results, as you'd expect. You can filter, you can do clever stuff. In milliseconds, you can search hundreds of thousands of contacts. That's at the heart of Covet. And in this case, we've got my friend, presumably Yvonne who has a principal in JP Morgan in a senior position in the UK. And that might be something I'm, I'm interested in, right? Second thing that COVID does, it provides perspective through visual, visualization. Now, we believe that after, you know, after the first 100 or 1,000 contacts, you just get lost. Hundreds of thousands of contacts is a number that people can't understand. You lose perspective. So COVID gives you that perspective, gives you maps, and helps you to visualize, to find the strengths of your network, to find the weaknesses of your network, not just your own network, your whole company's network. It also lets you dive in and do analytics. And these are on-the-fly analytics, calculated on the fly across hundreds of thousands of contacts. The last thing it does is <laughs> automagical stuff with data. All right? So you import uh, your contacts, you might import person's name, maybe their telephone, if you're lucky, their email. And what COVID does, it populates metadata. It might find the location, the industry they work in, it might find the company, it might find the job title of that person, it might even estimate how senior that person is, which enables your maps, your search, your company's network to have a lot more value through the metadata that we bring. So this is COVID's UI in a, in a nutshell. And, um, I put it up there, above the line. I love this shark, this little guy. Um, I put it there above the line for the users. There's an amazing user experience. It's pretty seamless. It's really fast. It's just loads of data instantly at the fingertips. You can do whatever you like with it. But below the line, there's this massive iceberg. There are sharks. It's really, really tough. And there are a lot of challenges to make it happen, OK? One of them is scalability. We need to be able to scale from one machine, literally, to hundreds, and we need that instantly. The moment a user comes on board, they expect stuff to happen instantly. And we need to scale to make that happen. And we also don't want the service to be running there all the time. So from zero to mega scale, whatever that means, uh, instantly. Challenge number one. Next challenge is um, using dozens of technologies. You can't do the kind of stuff I described by just one stack, right? We're .NET at the heart, we've got SQL, et cetera, et cetera, but you can't make that stuff happen. Hundreds of thousands of contacts, searchable, mapped, et cetera, et cetera, um, just with one technology. You have dozens of technologies at play. Of course, given the, the data that we use, it's contacts, it's people's personal stuff, it's important, it might be confidential, Security, security, security is at the heart of COVID. Anything we do at any layer, security is at the forefront of, of our thinking and our architecture. Right? And finally, because we are a, a company and we need to do stuff in an affordable way, cost. Cost is really important, of course. So we need to be able to scale. Oh my god, what happened to the font? Just realized. Um, <laughs> scale instantly across dozens of technology being really secure and cheap or, or rather cost effective. So this is, guys, this is the background of what we do and some of the big kind of business level challenges. 
And um, I'll take you through our journey, uh, our architecture journey, and how we started off, how it's changed along the way, um, and how we meet some of these challenges. Now, needless to say, we are, you know, we're still on that journey, we're still adapting, we're not there yet, um, but hopefully we've learned some things that we can share with you today. Right, so this is Covez architecture in a nutshell uh, about a year ago. A year ago, we were here in Cyprus. We did an alpha kind of pilot in a law firm, and that's what Covez looked like. We have a, an API um, that serves, serves requests, as you'd expect. We've got a single page application, a SPA, um, that's essentially the client. We have uh, a layer of consumers, essentially background workers. Background workers that do a lot of the, the heavy lifting. We have um, these guys called the queues in the middle. That's what enables the API to talk to the workers, to tell them what jobs to do, and also the workers to talk to each other and communicate what needs to happen. And in terms of underlying technology, as you'd expect, day one, we've got, we've got SQL that was provided uh, out of the box from Azure. By the way, this all hosted on Microsoft Azure Cloud. Um, although what we're going to say is, mostly agnostic of, of provider. Um, we're hosted on Azure, it just happens that we're hosted on Azure. So we have SQL, have a blob storage for files, backups, uh, images, that kind of stuff. And we've got some integrations with external services. We've got um, Gmail and the various exchanges that we draw contacts from. Um, Mandrill, which is a, a service for sending emails. As you can imagine, actually this is a good point, we use wherever we can, we use external services to do stuff that's already been done. You know, don't reinvent the wheel, the wheel. we do that wherever possible. We avoid doing that rather wherever possible. So, Mandrill for sending emails, Mapbox, top left, for uh, displaying our maps. We've got MaxMind, which is a service that allows you to map IP addresses to locations to enable our users to kind of be pinpointed on the map. Uh, Gravatar, some of you may know the service, it's, a, it's an avatar service. Um, and Encapsula, that's an interesting one, providing an extra layer of application level kind of security on top of everything. So all the traffic goes through Encapsula before it lands onto our servers. That's where we were, and, and it's quite a simple architecture actually, it's not, you know, it's not very complicated. Nevertheless, it did provide most of the benefits that we were after. It's really good. So, those are um, rapid access to technology, and literally, I could click a button, and, and these guys never let me click buttons, but <laughs> I could click a button um, and deploy a production grade, geo replicated, like super scale SQL database within minutes. And that's, that's pretty amazing, right? Um, it does enable you to scale at will. Again, there's this bar in the Azure Management Console, you drag it to the right, and you go from one server to hundreds of servers, that cost you hundreds of thousands and all of that stuff. So scale at will, although, as we'll see later, there are always limitations. It's not really at will, it's at will given the various constraints. Um, we were able, this one's really good, to adapt very quickly. Adapt to business problems, usability problems, technology problems, and release very, very quickly. We could do our release within four hours. Now, our usual cycle was once a week, so we start our, our week with our Scrum, we develop some features, we test them, we release them at the end of the week. Um, and this kind of architecture, together with the DevOps setup that uh, Michael will talk to us about in a second, um, enabled us to adapt and release very fast. As a startup, we found that invaluable, to be honest. Um, security out of the box. Security, as I said, very important to us, and being able to to trust to a certain extent. But you know what? SQL, it's been set up properly. You know, the guys, the clever guys in Microsoft know what they're doing at that level. Maybe even at the level above. So you can trust that security comes out of the box to a certain degree. It's not bad. Um, and the last point, I'm not kidding. In those early days, we paid more for coffee than we did on infrastructure. And it was all this stuff. You know, loads of servers doing their stuff, running, serving users. We paid more uh, for coffee, not bad at all. We quickly, though, reached uh, limitations, as you'd expect. Um, one of those related to the user experience. Uh, what we realized, as we saw our users playing around, 
is that not all users are equal all the time. You might have online users who expect one thing, you might have offline users who expect a different thing or maybe they don't expect much at all. So what we realized is that we need um, here we are, finer grain control of priorities. And the way we implement that, um, simplis simplified, is through a priority queuing system. We've got high priority queues where items that are of high priority go and get served immediately versus low priority queues that can happen whenever we, you know, whenever they can. So finer grain control of priorities through the use of um, different types of queues. Second problem was that, as you'd expect, you know, you need the right tools for the for the job. You can't do search in milliseconds, maps in milliseconds, uh, kind of have consistency of your data, do all the stuff that, that I talked about before um, without the right tools. And in our case, you know, SQL great, but not always the right tool. So first thing that we did, Elasticsearch, it's a dedicated search you know, system uh, based on Lucene that sits on Linux servers that actually Manolo's over here implemented um, and allows us to do exactly that. Search across hundreds of thousands of contacts, search the world within milliseconds. So right technology for a specific job. Similarly, we've got um, our graph database. So the best way to connect people and share contacts and display the maps that we found at least is through the use of a graph database. And in our case, we chose OrientDB, um, which is an open source graph database. And in order to resolve some of the issues that the guys will talk about in a second, so things like concurrency and um, eventual consistency and so on, we've put a, a layer in between the database and the rest of the system through a middleware kind of orient worker. So this guy, he receives requests to write to the database, either through high priority for online people or lower priority for offline people, and then the, the worker decides how to write them, when to write them, it applies its own logic to make sure that things happen in a consistent manner. Now, I mentioned scale at will before, and I, I mentioned some limitations. Now, one of those limitations, quite a detailed one, but you know what, you come across tens of those in your... <clears throat> limitations, thank you very much. Technology limitations, exactly. Get opportunity for a break. <laughs> yeah, pro probably the cat's to blame. Don't trust the cat. But while we wait for that, are there any kind of preliminary questions maybe on the stuff I've already touched on? People like that? So we use, thank you very much. So, so we've got SQL, which is Microsoft SQL, out of the box, Canvas a search from Azure. Elasticsearch, that is a NoSQL kind of thing. And OrientDB, which is a graph database. So three databases, which actually poses quite a few problems that, that we'll see in a second. So where were we? Yes, scaling. So um, there we are, scaling limitations. It's quite a little problem, but you run across a lot of these in your path to kind of instant scalability, which is kind of the dream. Um, one of those was the fact that the moment you, you pull that bar to the right and the workers come online, they have a demand of SQL for their data, their static data. So it might be lists of countries, it might be lists of companies. Now that kind of demand puts a pressure on, on our database. And what we realized is if you pull the bar to the right too fast, your, kind of your SQL gets overloaded um, because of that initial load. A very micro problem with a very specific solution, we introduced a special cache, a data cache, which caches this static data. So now you can pull the bar to the right, you can scale your workers without, um, without affecting your live system and your live users. Um, this is one of the many scalability related limitations. And to close off here where we are today or yesterday, um, we've added a few features. We've got an iPhone application. We've got um, access to external sources of data, and we integrate with more external systems. Again, we use the same pattern. We've got a worker to do the heavy lifting. We've got queues for um, delivering the messages and communicating. Um, 
Another slide says that, you know, that's today, but actually it's yesterday, because we've already got our roadmap of, for the next 18 months of how this stuff will change. Um, business requirements kind of develop, user feedback develops, technologies develop. We already have, you know, as you'd expect, a massive list of things we'd like to change. So this is where we are today, or we were yesterday. Um, and I now hand over to, to the guys, and hand over to Manolis, who will um, dive quite a bit deeper into our back end and our workings. Um, hope it's not too scary, but please lock the door. Nobody's allowed to leave. <laughs> over to you, Manolis. Hello, everyone. Um, so let's see, let's test a little bit. Are you sure? Okay. Hi, my name is Manolis. Um, I'm a software engineer working at the back end of Cover. Very nice to be here today. So let's start right away. Uh, some minutes ago, we saw this very nice picture in color, not like this. And uh, right now, we're going to deep dive a little bit in this part. This is the back end of our solution. And this is where magic happens for us. And OK, Michael, who works in the front end, does some magic too, but OK. <laughs> Uh, so let's, we will not dive in so, so deep. Um, uh, we'll try to touch the surface because, as you can understand, this is uh, a lot of things to talk about. We can talk about later on. So let's start about the API. Uh, we have uh, at the top of everything, as you see, almost at the top. We have a, uh, our API, which is an HTTP stateless, uh, RESTful uh, web API, which uh, what it does is receiving requests from the outside world, our single page application our iPhone client, and tomorrow our Android client or whatever. And they processes what we call fast requests in the order of some, a few uh, hundred milliseconds. Um, we have an Azure Cloud service, as everything is in Azure for us, uh, which is deployed separately than all the others, and has its own scaling and uh, rules and policy. Whatever cannot be touched uh, or processed by our API, it's forwarded to our background workers. Uh, our background workers do the heavy lifting in our application, and uh, we use a producer-consumer model for this. That means that uh, someone produces a work item, and someone else consumes this, this item. Uh, we have a dedicated producer role, which uh, produces periodically items for some works that needs to be done, like notification, for example for the users, but we have also our consumers and our API, which can play the role of producer uh, while producing items triggered by specific actions. Let's say we had a contact, someone has a contact, an action is triggered in order to, be, to index this contact in our Elasticsearch uh, tool. Uh, they also live in their own ecosystem environment, in their own server, so they can scale with different criteria and policies. So how these, uh, all these things uh, communicate between them? This happens with uh, message queues. Message queues and also a functionality offered by Azure, Azure Message Queues, which offer a persistent way to exchange messages between services. We use a high-low priority model because uh, there are actions that need to be treated as, as soon as possible and others that can take a lower priority on our uh, procedure. Uh, so this is a very interesting fact that you can utilize in some designs. Um, the queue size shows what we have to do, our workload. So the queue size is always a scaling factor for all our services and all our services. Uh, this is a great architecture, works very well. However, it poses the problem of tightly coupling uh, some service between them. That means uh, someone does something and has to inform everyone else who is interested about the actions that he performed. This is not desirable always, so we are moving towards a more event-driven model with publish-subscribe uh, pattern, where someone does a job, announces the result, and all the ones who are interested just subscribe the results of this action. So loose recoupling between services. So now let's see a small example about how all these things work together and what is the workflow of an action in Cover. Here is our little Kobe, the guy who died before, but now he's okay. <laughs> Uh, he adds a contact in his uh, address book in Google, and uh, our producer comes slowly, uh, periodically, and checks for changes. When he finds a change, he informs our sync consumer through a message queue that we saw before that, okay, for this user we have to sync, we have changes. The message is added in the queue, 
it's slowly going down, executes at some, at some time, and this triggers a lot of actions. We uh, write this contact in our SQL database, for start, but this is not enough. We have two more databases, at least, uh, to update. We have a graph database to update, we have a search database to update, and we have to do a lot of work, metadata population, the duping items, uh, that need to be taken care of uh, sequentially. So, we include an item to our graph consumer so that this item, this contact can be written in the graph database. We do the same for our search database. And let's say we include an item in order to check for duplicates in our address book now that we have a new contact that will be treated like all the others. So let's go. Let's assume that the two first guys are quite fast because we need our system to be as soon as possible consistent in terms of data, you know, databases. And the, the dupe item takes some more time to be executed, to be processed. Uh, if we find some similarities, let's say if we find the duplication between two contracts, we merge the image and we do the next step, which is updating the image in all the databases that refer to this contact. So at this point, we have reached a certain equilibrium in our application. Uh, <clears throat> as you saw earlier during the presentation, we are distributed since day one. That means that uh, we have a system that works in a distributed environment. But we need more. Uh, we need more. Why? Because the need is increases exponentially as we grow up as a, as a, <coughs> as a company. Sorry. Why we need this? We need the finer grain scaling. This is very important for an application that's online on the cloud, distributed. Uh, we need the uh, ability to be more flexible on how and when we scale our application. And not all the parts, but maybe sometimes one part of the application, not all. Okay. Uh, we need a better uh, deployment policy and granularity, not policy, let's say. <clears throat> we need to be able to, live, <clears throat> to have each service in its own ecosystem. That means from development to deployment, have everything completely decoupled from the others. Uh, decoupling, okay? Loose recoupling between different parts of the different parts of the application and better fault isolation. That means everyone must have minimum knowledge about what happens around <coughs> around him, and everyone should affect in a minimum way all the other parts of the application in case that an error exists. Also, we have the freedom, we need the freedom to choose the best, the optimum technology for what needs to be done. Like, for example, with a graph database and search. So, for these reasons, we are heading towards <coughs> to what is referred as microservices. Generally speaking, because it's a huge deal to <coughs> go right now, microservices is an even more distributed architecture than the one I got. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> that the one that the one we are currently on, and uh, which improves our modularity and scalability, the coupling between our uh, services of, of, the, of the application, and uh, all the issues that we saw before. So now, let's uh, welcome Valadis on stage. He will talk about um, generally issues that we face when living in a distributed environment. Thanks. Well, hi from me. I'm Valadis. I often offer a helping hand at Michals and the front end, but basically implement core features on the back end, like uh, covers, connections, notifications, and automatic emails. Opa. <laughs> Okay. So, developing uh, distributed uh, architectures, you face a lot of challenges, and basically, you can't expect things to work as they would in a monolithic architecture. 
Well, the first problem is that operations fail. As you see, slow and unreliable network connection can cost time out. Also, from time to time, service B may not reply. You have to expect that services can and will from time to time not reply or fail. So, the first solution to this problem is the applying the circuit breaker pattern. Uh, suppose that we have service B, which is a flaky service, and from time to time it fails. Wouldn't it be better that service A monitored service B state and knew that the service B is in a bad state and not send a message at all? Basically, that's what the circuit breaker does. Sorry. It avoids calling the real operation when a certain failure rate has been reached. This way, service A does not waste resources on an operation that will most likely fail and will also give service B, service B room to breathe because it's really not helpful hammering a failing service. The second solution is the retry pattern. The retry pattern and the circuit breaker patterns are different, but they can be used together. In the circuit breaker pattern, we don't do an operation because we expect it will fail. In the retry pattern, on the other hand, we do an operation when we expect that it will succeed. And basically, what you do is you have a different policy based on service B's answers. If service B gives us a fault error that we have never seen before, we suspect that it's a, it's a, it's a rare error, and if we try immediately, we will, we will succeed. So we will try immediately. If service B replies an error, let's say, like an authentication failure, we expect that if you will try immediately, you will fail, so we throw an error immediately. One more algorithm you can use is the exponential back-off algorithm, basically leaving longer, longer waits between its retry call. Another solution, of course, is improving by increasing your availability through redundancy. Why have one of its thing when you can have more of its thing? The reason why you can't always do that is because it's expensive and you got to, to have an end to end strategy to do a thing like that. And uh, developers must know that wasting uh, money on cloud fees is really easy. You just da don't press the off button on Azure and you leave a VM open without a reason. Well, the second big problem is that when you have, like we do, different data stores, like we have Elasticsearch, an SQLDB and an ORDB, interval of times exist where data are inconsistent between these three different data stores. And this, of course, affects the UI experience. Say, for example, that I search for software engineers in Cove, and I see that Alex Industry is software and he works in Cyprus. But moments ago, I changed his country from Cyprus to Greece. But the elastic search hasn't yet been updated. So the data are inconsistent temporarily. So we could always have consistent data, but the user would have to wait long periods of time, and that's unacceptable. As you understand, this is a speed availability consistency trade-off, and it affects the application programmer. Well, the solution to this problem is that you have to reduce your inconsistent window based on your business needs. And what we'll do is, using high priority queues, and scaling out. Another solution you can have is a UI solution. A UI client may, may have its own version of the data, even though you got different data on the data stores at the need, and when all the data stores are updated and have the consistent version of the data, they notify the UI and the UI gets the latest and stable and consistent version of the data. Well, we talked about queues, but queues in distributed environments need special handling. Uh, they, of course, they have to be persistent, so you can't afford to lose an item. If an item fails, you have to re queue it, put that get in the queue, and, but you can't let it in the queue forever if it keeps on failing and failing and failing, 
So at the time you have to decide, characterize it as a poison work item and discard it from the queue. So another problem is that scaling, scaling out is really nice, but if you scale out and you haven't algorithms uh, made right, you may disrupt FIFO. The last problem, of course, are concurrency issues. When you have a lot of workers who are waiting on the same piece of data, you get a lot of concurrency exceptions. And scaling out makes things even worse. Well, a few solutions to this problem is uh, the distributed mutex, where if you have a lot of workers that want to write on the same uh, piece of data, uh, a worker gets one only of those workers gets a message, a specialized message, and then he can work on the data. All the others work, all the other workers cannot get the same message, and they have to decide on their own what to do. Maybe work on another work item or wait. Another solution is the middleware writer, as you can see. Suppose we have three writers that want to write in the same DB. They don't write on their own on the DB. They send all their rights to the middleware writer guy, and he writes. He's the only one that writes on the DB, thus avoiding any concurrency issues. And of course, as we said, scaling out may, has to be business or the, has to be based on, the, on your business domain. For, for example, we have algorithms and work items per contact. So we know that only one of these workers at any time uh, works on a specific contact. So that's all for me. Now you're going to hear about the box from Mike. Hello, folks. Uh, I'm Michael. Um, uh, a bit of, but about my background. Uh, I used to work uh, in uh, NATO Secret Certified uh, Defense Software for uh, around seven years. And I've been involved in uh, a lot of um, uh, web applications one way or another. And I've been with uh, Coves since the beginning. And I'm actually in charge of uh, the front end development. Uh, we're doing the spy in AngularJS. I'm also in charge of uh, DevOps. And uh, in my free time, I play, play around with uh, OrientDB and um, I explore new architectures. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk to you about how we're getting our code uh, deployed to the cloud. Uh, the cloud is a big place far away from home. Uh, so taking care of uh, infrastructure that has to work like uh, a cloud. Uh, requires good planning and great tools. Since everything is remote, uh, we're giving the, the opportunity to uh, automate everything and uh, introduce built-in fail-safes that are going to give us peace of mind. When planning our DevOps, um, we had clear goals. Uh, we wanted an automated process that um, guaranteed release uh, cycles that were shorter than a week. Um, whilst contain, uh, maintaining a constant high level of uh, quality control and uh, <coughs> making sure that each part of uh, the architecture is scaling on its own. So we created three different cloud environments. We have the development, the testing, and the production environment uh, at which uh, different parts of the code are deployed. And all three environments are uh, similar between them. Uh, in order to minimize the possibility that uh, we have different behaviors from the development uh, up to the production uh, releases. But each one has a purpose to serve. Every change must pass all three environments uh, before going live. This ensures that rigorous testing will happen and that we have a better chance of uh, getting, uh, 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 eliminating issues along the way. So for our code, we're using, we're using the Git flow methodology uh, of working with uh, Git branches, allowing major features to be developed on their own branch in parallel, uh, whilst uh, at the same time having stable branches that we can deploy uh, at any time. Um, each service uh, developed on its uh, own repository and has its own version. 
Uh, thus, we can um, deploy parts of the application on their own. So if you make a code change that affects a certain service, you only have to replace that service on uh, the cloud architecture, thus minimizing dis uh, disruption. Um, using, we're using pull requests. And using pull requests before new code is integrated into stable branches uh, improves code quality as well as, well as uh, developer cross-domain awareness. Um, Hooking up peer reviews with uh, automated builds, as we will see here. This is a pull request, uh, which has been reviewed by another developer. And it has passed uh, uh, a build process from the automated uh, continuous integration server. Uh, and all the tests. And now we get a message that everything is safe to, uh, to merge. So combining peer reviews with uh, automation just sweetens the deal. Uh, a very important part of um, today's DevOps is continuous integration. Uh, our weapon of choice for continuous integration is uh, Team City, along with, uh, which is a build server, uh, along with uh, the Azure Cloud uh, plugin uh, to manage uh, distributed uh, virtual machine build agents. And um, we use the Azure Blob Storage to uh, hold the build artifacts. Uh, our build server is uh, responsible for building, testing, packaging, and deploying our code to uh, Windows Azure. Using a single orchestrator, which is uh, Team CD, uh, coupled with uh, distributed uh, build agents, allows for uh, our build system, our continuous integration system, to be scalable as well, um, whilst keeping the cost down. This means that if there is a spike in um, uh, development effort, in, uh, we, we get more commits in a single uh, moment of time. Uh, we spawn more uh, build agents, uh, and continuous integration speed is kept constant. But when that spike is over, we uh, deprovision them automatically, so um, we're not charged for them anymore. Uh, since the cloud configurations, since the cloud environment is so dynamic, uh, services and features come and go daily. Um, build configurations are as important as complex as code. So uh, we, treat them, we treat them as code, we keep them under version control, and uh, we make sure that uh, clean code uh, patterns are used there as well. Depending on your cloud provider, you might get lucky and get all your services uh, provided as uh, PaaS, which is platform as a service. Um, but this is not always a reality. Uh, in our case, we have Elasticsearch and OrienDB, which weren't provided, and we had to actually turn to YAS, which is Infrastructure as a Service, um, which is, again, is not always a bad thing because, uh, although more involved, gives you more flexibility. Path deploy is straightforward. You just uh, package your code from the build server, you deploy it in the stage environment, uh, you do some testing there, and if everything is okay, you just flip a switch and it goes live into production uh, with uh, no downtime. And of course, scaling is automatic. You just scale it up, and it makes today you can have one server, and tomorrow you can have 10,000 servers just by giving a single command. Yes, as uh, I mentioned earlier, is more involved. We have to provision the machines one by one using um, partial scripts uh, that deal with uh, how, how many disks uh, and what configuration of the disk will be, will be in the machine, if it will have a load balancer. Uh, what will the machine configuration be, etc. And um, the scaling will be again automatic, but you would have to have pre provision the machines before actually scaling out. Uh, bootstrapping and configuration of VMs uh, is done using in house uh, build puppet modules. Cluster deployment is a bit trickier. Uh, Windows Azure does not support multicasting, and so we have to find a way for machines to discover each other. This is done um, using, by leveraging the Azure SDK, uh, so each machine can discover its peers and connect to it. But because each uh, service has its own clustering, clustering mechanism, combining that with uh, the, the cloud provider you're using is not always an easy task. Uh, let's talk about large, large scale. Tens or hundreds or thousands of different servers running application, different applications uh, running somewhere um, around the planet with no physical access. 
requires monitoring and management uh, to be centralized. This is why uh, we need uh, modern tools designed for the cloud. One such tool is uh, Puppet. Uh, what I say is uh, one Puppet master to rule them all. Puppet is a master slave uh, configuration uh, technology. So each VM asks the Puppet master uh, what its state should be. The pu Puppet master has uh, a configuration that sends to that machine. And that machine makes sure that uh, it will uh, obey it. So changing a version of a service or changing a password happens only in one single machine. And then tens or hundreds or thousands of machines obey that change and change it in the next five minutes. New Relic is another uh, uh, external tool that we use that uh, is uh, a monitoring service that gives us uh, an insight on our application performance and uh, health. So we can uh, rest assured that um, everything is running nicely while we're busy developing new features. Finally, uh, since we have different services manipulating the same data at the same time, uh, we need an aggregation of uh, what's happening. So we're using an external service, uh, which is log entries to aggregate the, the logs and create <coughs> alerts there. So let's see if we accomplished uh, everything we wanted. These were um, our tasks. And I would say yes, and like a boss, if I might add. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys. Um, I presume we've got a few precious minutes for, for any questions. Of course, myself and the guys are, are at the conference the rest of the day. So if there's any, any stuff you'd like to discuss in detail, more than happy. Um, we've got some time for questions. We have right? about 10 minutes for Q&A. Any questions? Gentlemen in the front. Hi. As a startup, why didn't you go for an open source stack like, uh, I don't know, SQL or My, uh, MySQL or? Ooh, good question. Good question. Java, maybe. Big question takes us back to our roots. Um, I, I might pass the microphone around as well for a diplomatic answer, but um, I think there are a few things. One of them is skill set. You know, as a startup, we learn just loads of stuff every single day. But you know what? If there's some things that you can avoid learning, that's a good thing because you already know them. So skill set is one thing. Um, the other one I think is the right tool for the job. Um, we've got some open source stuff. We've got some non-open source stuff. We contribute some stuff to the community. So it's a mix. It's not a, a single thing. Um, so I think you know the answer is the right tool for the job, but also probably use the stuff you know uh, if, if it suits. Um, Guys? Good enough? Yeah, check? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? So um, you mentioned microservices before. And um, how do you, well, uh, it's two questions basically. So how do you, what's the transport you use between the services? And then how does service A know where service B is? Okay, I won't even dare to answer that one. Um, Mike would like, I think, falls slightly into your domain in terms of how services discover each other. Uh, th this is uh, what we're uh, moving towards. Um, today we have some distributed systems, but our uh, main goal, our, our uh, future goal is to actually have everything being uh, an in independent microservice. For that reason, we, uh, today, for our uh, infrastructure, the communication mechanism between services is uh, service que is uh, queues, uh, which is uh, an implementation of a uh, simple message queue, which is FIFO. Um, for tomorrow's architecture, I could say that it's something more involved like a uh, service bus, which uh, actually has who sends what to who and things like that. And you can register to certain uh, channels. Um, mostly that is our uh, communication mechanism. And for discovering your peers, for uh, specific in uh, Azure Cloud, you would have to, again, um, leverage the Azure SDK and uh, ask someone who's, who will be the, the controller. Um, if you want a job to be done, say, I want to save this contact, you would have to go ask, to him, uh, ask him, where would I post this in which service bus? Uh, so it would be saved, and 
leveraging the Azure SDK, he would discover which service does that, and if its IP has changed or things like that, or how many instances it has, and then come back to you with an answer. Cool, thank you. One fundamental difference from the model we're currently in uh, to the one we're going towards is that now when um, each consumer, each, each um, let's say consumer, each service listens, has two cues to which it listens. So everyone who wants to uh, do something and inform this, this service has to post things to these cues. So I, I do something and I post things to 10 other cues in order to inform everyone to do their job. The, the critical difference to the other architecture is that I do something and I just uh, update my queue. I have only one queue, that it's what I've done. So if everyone is interested in my job, should register to this queue and do whatever needs to be done. This, this goes to looser coupling between our services. And imagine you now have one service that listens to the queue, tomorrow you have two, and the next time you have a thousand, and then you move all, and nothing happens to the functionality that is the core functionality that is being executed. And uh, of course, we will throw all this away. We will find a new feature, implement it as a microservice, integrate it, and then move on to the other things. Very good addition. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, uh, hello, I'm glad, I'm glad I stayed at the end, it was interesting. Uh, I have three easy questions. Uh, Kobe comes from Connection, Kone, or yes? So, yeah, it's, uh, because we are a Greek Cypriot startup, okay. the root is in Kone, which means for people who aren't from Greek Cyprus, is to, to, to make a connection with somebody. It's a bit cheeky. Um, it also, and this might have happened afterwards in our minds, kind of um, remind people of Cove, Cove being uh, something safe, a safe harbor where maybe your contacts live. Okay, the second question is, where is the fifth member of the team? The fifth member, actually our team has about 10 members. Um, <laughs> some of them are in front of you, some of them are behind you, surrounded by us. And You're the, the only question. actual audience member. The last, question goes, <laughs> <laughs> the last question goes to, I think, Manolis. Uh, Manolis, are you a scuba diver or something? Are you, do, do you do scuba diving? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Why? Because you said uh, in the deep down you have to be, what did you say? To you? Uh, black, uh, you said black end, you should say black end because it's like black box, no? Uh, <laughs> okay, yes, it's a uh, black end, black end also, if you want uh, like this. But okay, I told you that magic happens in Mike's uh, aspect also. Eh? Don't forget Mike. And Alex there also. Yes. <laughs> slower is up. Get the guy in front of you is slow. <laughs> slow and reliable guy. Hi. Um, here. Following up, Alex is coming on microservices. Are you using Akka? Are you thinking to move there? Yes, no, why? Any volunteers for that question? Do you know do you know Akka? Akka. Akka. Is for implementing microservices? Um, actually, we're, we're mainly used to open end. So, sorry, let me introduce Zaf formally now. Zaf is one of the other members of our development team. Mm -hmm. um, so, we are exploring several uh, t uh, technologies, and uh, Akka is a very promising event driven uh, thing. Uh, I'm not sure if it is uh, anything for .NET. I know it's popular for Scala and for for Java, um, but we are in the process of exploring this kind of things. So, most probably. So, so you're not gonna ever leave .NET or? No, no. actually, uh, this architecture, uh, the microservices or the distributed architecture uh, enables you to do exactly this, but not holistically. Not uh, one service could be written in F -sharp or in Scala, another in C -sharp. And uh, as guys mentioned, um, if you use a tool like um, OrinDB, for example, they have a great um, uh, Java client and maybe a not so good .NET client. So uh, we could definitely, in the microservices world, uh, use a, uh, the Java client because 
all the service, the Orient worker, um, could be written in Java. Akados is coming with Java. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know, yeah. Question? No? One last question from somebody who's not a member of the team. <laughs> Me being a designer, what programming languages do you use to write the API? So I heard you mentioned AngularJS, but that's a front end. Participants, coming up next, Alexis Mikhail around the world in 80 milliseconds in industry disruption. MPN Meliti from Reload Greece in entrepreneurial environments and Mikhail Stavridis with financial toolkit for startups in startup world. Coming up now. Ladies and gentlemen, the ship will sail. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'll just give a really quick overview of uh, the things we use. For front end, uh, we're using uh, AngularJS with uh, build tools like uh, uh, Bower, uh, Node, um, um, and uh, others. So for uh, uh, the back end, we, we usually use uh, .NET. Um, so the, uh, the whole API is uh, written in uh, C Sharp. And um, for deployment, we use uh, things like um, Parcel. We use uh, Linux scripts. We have a multitude of uh, languages, and we, while toward, uh, moving towards the microservices, uh, we're hoping to uh, use even more because we believe in its tool to its uh, own job. Yes, uh, I guess we're out of time. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, and um, the, the prerequisite plug as well, I, I don't urge you to log in to covet.com C-O-V-V-E, uh, sign up, experience it for yourself, send us your feedback, we love feedback, um, and yeah, see you around. <laughs>